Hey Hotshots, Jess with Emotional Fire Academy here today to talk about three super powerful ways to love yourself as a highly sensitive person. Subscribe to my channel if you are a highly sensitive person looking to up-level your life and totally rock it in 2021. I'm here to help you do that. I provide weekly tips, tricks, and tools to do just that. Who am I? I'm Jess. I'm your driver operator on this journey. I'm a former firefighter and, and a master NLP practitioner. So today we're going to be giving you three really, really important practices. And, and these might seem like very subtle differences and subtle techniques that the, they're going to cause, if you do them, profound, profound changes in you as a highly sensitive person. This is what I have found. This is what I have done. And that's what I teach on my channel. So um, now we're going to go back to the emotional fire triangle. I haven't had it around for a little while. So welcome back, emotional fire triangle. I'm glad it's here today to help me demonstrate these three strategies. And these are basically learning how to reframe things using language and the quality of the story that you're telling about whatever data you're, that you're taking in. So let's start with our physiology. So just a quick refresher on the emotional fire triangle. I believe and NLP, the basis of NLP is that our emotional reactions come from three things, our physiology, our conditioning, and the language that we're using to describe whatever's happening at the time. In the middle then is the fire of emotion kind of rising up and consuming everything. So when we're, we want to move into self-love, and self-love is a very hot topic right now in personal development, everybody's talking about it, what is it, why is it important for highly sensitive people? It's because the very, the traditional definitions of being a highly sensitive person, the DOES acronym, if you're familiar with that, and Elaine Aaron's work. Um, so a lot of the early research on highly sensitive people identified them by this DOES acronym. So D, depth of processing, O, overstimulation, E, emotional reactivity, and S, sensitivity to subtleties. Two of those four descriptors for highly sensitive people the overstimulation and the emotional reactivity are not are very disempowering. That just by the nature of the words that were used in that acronym to describe those two characteristics, it feels very disempowered. It's very victimizing, right? It's like the overstimulation, the emotional reactivity are very disempowering words in themselves. And so this there's almost this very inherent kind of victimization in being a highly sensitive person. And that's why I wanted to talk about self-love because self-love is about removing any, removing those power structures, right? Meeting something with complete acceptance because loving something unconditionally is meeting it with acceptance, you know, meeting it in a place of where there's no power dynamic. And so there is no victim or um, bad guy, that some of the personas that I've talked about in other videos, you know, removing that and meeting something with love is doing that, is stripping away the power and just unconditionally, you know, accepting whatever is in front of you. So doing that for ourselves as highly sensitive person, people is, is very important because, you know, when we're classically described by certain words and labels that are, have inherent victimization in them or set us up to step into that role, you know, like saying, oh, this is normal. This is normal to feel overstimulated. It's normal to be emotionally reactive. We forget that there are other ways then to, to show up in more loving ways for ourselves, our body, the words, we, you know, our language, our conditioning. So today we're going we're gonna to get to these three strategies. So let me dive back into the strategies. That was kind of a, a side, a foundational thought to kind of explain where we're going with this. So on the physiology side, how do we step into that, the power that we have in our consciousness? We want to move into a place of symbiosis with our physiology, with our body. Because again, when the scales get unbalanced, when, when we're when we are either running the show, we, when I say our consciousness is running the show over our body and not listening to our body, or our body is running the show over us, again, there creates this power imbalance 
that feels a lot like, it feels very negative. There's a negative feeling, sensation associated with that. And so when we're talking about moving into a place of symbiosis with our body, what does that actually look like? Like, how do we do that in, in real life, in a practical way? So we realize that our body is a source of data for us, right? As highly sensitive people, we are, we are processing a lot of data. Our body is just another source of data. Remember, the data is neutral. All data is neutral. It's our interpretation of the data that makes the difference in whether we ignite the fire, you know, the fire of emotion, the quality then of our language. So we're bringing, you know, we have our body here and we're bringing our, you know, our, our consciousness, the quality of our consciousness in the language and the conditioning, we're kind of bringing it in and creating this symbiosis with our body instead of feeling like, again, we're tossed about by our body. And I see a lot of people doing this when they feel out of control in something that their body is doing to them. It feels very victimizing. Like when they say, you know, um, for instance, someone who says, I'm, I'm anxious. I feel anxious, right? That's the data coming from their body. I feel anxious. They feel this, this rise of energy in their body and they're labeling it as anxiety, which becomes then this, it starts to grow into this kind of larger cloud of a problem, right? And then, and then you can feel like, I'm anxious, I'm anxious, I'm anxious, I'm scared, I'm, I'm worried, I'm scared, I'm worried, you know, I'm anxious. So they're taking that data, that sensation of the enhanced energy in their body and applying the label, the words, the story of I'm anxious over top of it. And then that creates this kind of conflict between consciousness and body where you're trying to, you're trying to fix a problem. You're trying to fix that anxiety or make it go away. Or when this is, and now instead, this is what you can do. Move into a symbiotic state with that. All right. So you feel the, you feel the sensation arising in you, this increased energy in your body. And you decide your consciousness, your language and your conditioning decide, I'm going to apply a different story to this. I'm going to say, I'm excited. I'm excited. I'm, I'm excited. I'm excited. I'm, I'm excited. I'm ready to go. Let's go. Let's do this. Let's do this. I'm ready to jump in there. And so you can feel the difference in those two of taking what essentially is the exact same data from your body. Cause really when you think, if you try to discern between anxious and excited, they feel very, very similar in the body. They might even be the exact same thing. They probably are. It's just that interpretation that our consciousness is putting on top of it that then makes the difference. And see how, how the first one, I'm anxious, creates a problem, a conflict, something that needs to be addressed. It takes our focus. It, it divides. It divides the body and the consciousness. The, I'm excited. I'm excited. I, I am excited. I, I feel it in my body. I'm excited. My body and I are ready. We're ready. It's, it's a coming together. That quality of interpretation is more of a coming together, more of a merging of a symbiotic, a symbiotic interpretation so that you and your body then can move forward together instead of fighting each other along the path, I'm wasting a lot of energy. So yeah, so that is one way and that that's a huge way when you, when you start to do that, wow, like that difference of being becoming symbiotic with your body, with your physiology, with the data that your body is giving you and and applying interpretations that, that promote symbiosis instead of conflict. That is, I mean, it's the essence of self-love that, right? That's meeting something unconditionally being like, I feel the sensation and I'm meeting it and accepting it. And I'm going to apply an interpretation that makes it, easier for my body instead of harder for my body and for me that I'm not struggling that I'm not struggling with my body I'm not trying to fight it and you know it's bucking me and I'm bucking it and no we're moving as a unit because symbiosis is that mutually beneficial relationship between two organisms so become symbiotic with your body give it good interpretations instead of bad ones all right so moving on to uh let's go to language next so how do we, what is a really powerful way 
with language to become more self-loving, to become more accepting and be able to meet ourselves where we are and thus propagate more positive feelings instead of negative. I think it's about increasing your credibility, your credibility, as you having the final say. I did another video about why do I cry so easily and get upset about everything. I'll link the video above. It was, an, I think, one of my best videos. Check that one out and then come back and watch the rest of this video. Um, because I described how language, the pro the sensitivity issue that we often have with language is that we are, we are susceptible. There's a susceptibility to the language of others and interpreting it as our truth. So when we want to be more powerful in our language, be more powerful and self-loving in our language patterns, we need to increase our own credibility. And what does this mean? This means that we always have the final say. We always have the final interpretation of whatever we are trying to sort out. We, you know, we we have the final story. We're like, yes, I've heard the opinions of all these other people, but I I am this is my final say. I am my credibility is what counts. I am the expert on me. I am the creator. I use my own language to craft my reality because that's what we're doing. And so increasing your personal credibility with yourself. And this is just, this is just a basically, again, how do we do this on a practical level? It's just a matter of, I have the final word. I have the final word. I don't care what anyone else says. I have the final word on this. I know I have the final word. I have the final word. I've listened to the opinions of others, no matter whether I perceive them to have more authority than I do or more knowledge than I do. I create with my language. And that's true because we do, we, each of us creates with this, the quality of the language, the thoughts, the stories that we tell ourselves in our own head. So increase your credibility with yourself and always know that you have the final say. So it doesn't matter what the expert has told you or what, whoever has told you what, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because you have the final say, you have the final say. And that, that again, bringing that control back to yourself in terms of language, in terms of like, yeah, I've listened to what everybody else says and this is what I think. This is what I think and, and this is what I choose to believe and to, to reinforce in my own mind, this is a story I'm going to tell myself and this is what I choose to believe. Now, again, very, very self-loving, very, very safe. The safety that comes from that in, in feeling that and knowing that you are the ultimate expert and you can rest safely in that, in that again, hopefully habitual process of continually, continually bringing it back to yourself and saying, I have the final word. I get to decide. I get to decide. It's my decision. It's my thoughts. It's my story. It's my narrative. I am going to ultimately control it and not give the power away. Again, again, not giving the power away to other people that we think are more credible or have more information or authority than we do because we're the experts on us. Each one of us is the expert on us and our experience of life. So, all right, the last one, conditioning. What is the super powerful strategy to deal with this side of the triangle? And the question we want to ask, so conditioning is our, is our collection of habits, assumptions, beliefs, you know, the really deeply ingrained stuff that we've just practiced over and over again. We've practiced and essentially that collection of stuff, of constructs is us, is our, is our perception of self, our self-concept, our self, you know, our collection of beliefs, which do shift over time and, and as we grow and mature. And the question we want to ask is, do I like to be me? Do I like to be that? Is, is that collection of beliefs, thoughts, assumptions, habits, is it, is the experience of that, which I perceive being me, is it positive? Do I enjoy it? Do I enjoy it? This was probably one of the most profound questions that I asked myself as a highly sensitive person that when I answered it, completely, completely transformed my life. 
do I like to be me? And a lot of the stuff that was in there, it wasn't pleasant. It wasn't, it wasn't a pleasant aspect that I had curated in being me. You know, it was things that I thought were there because they had to be there. But then doing that house cleaning of like, okay, my focus now is I want to enjoy being me. I want to enjoy being me. And so then starting to just as a daily practice, again, this, this doesn't have to be this massive thing. It's just a decision to be like, I'm going to, I'm going to start to condition myself in a way that is pleasant to be me on a daily basis, on a minute by minute basis, on an hour by hour basis. It is pleasant to be me as an experience, as a consciousness, as a body, as a everything that I am, as a habit, as a, it's pleasant to be that. So again, you make the decision. I want to be, I want it to be pleasant. So then you start, you know, you'll naturally start filtering things through that. I want it to be pleasant to be me. Okay. So what, what are the better thoughts? You know, what are the better stories with, you know, what's happening with my body? How, how do I tell a better story? I have better thoughts where it's more pleasant to be me. And that again, starts to recondition you, who you are, your concept of self, your, your beingness and open it up, make it more expansive, make it more pleasant to be you. <clears throat> and so again, how do we do this on a practical level? We make the decision. I want to be, I want it to be pleasant to be me. And then we filter incoming the new stuff through that. I'm like, is it pleasant to be me? Okay, great. I'm going to keep it. If not pff, pitch it, you know, don't, don't let it linger in my consciousness. Don't accept it. Just ignore it. And anything that is older, any, any of these older beliefs or assumptions that we're using, um, we just gently kind of start to push them out of our consciousness, you know, or we totally accept new beliefs. We're like, like for instance, if I decide I really like French fries and I, I want to believe instead that fr the French fries are junk food, that French fries are healthy for me. I want to believe that. And so I'm going to believe that because that's what I'm choosing. It's about intentionally choosing your belief systems and getting deep into your belief systems and altering them so that it's more pleasant to be you so that you can eat French fries without guilt. And so, you know, you find, and it's, it can be as simple as, you know, finding the French fry recipes that appear more healthy to you or just totally, you know, throwing out the old, the old thoughts and old guilt about eating French fries. There's many different ways to do this, but at the core level, it's, it's really committing to, I want to make it pleasant as a habit to be me and then reaching for the thoughts and the beliefs and the assumptions and the habits that support that, that really, really actually support that. So let me know what you think. Leave a comment below um, and tell me if you've ever tried any one of these things <clears throat> and tell me if you do try them, what you find as an experiment and you know, go out and experiment with these. See, see the type of self-love you can generate from trying one of these three strategies. And again, just as a reminder, um, the three strategies are move into symbiosis with your body, you know, tell better stories about what's happening with your body that will support you and make it easier on your body for everybody. So that you're moving into a symbiosis with your body instead of fighting against it. With your language, give yourself the ultimate credibility, listen to yourself and choose intentionally what you want to believe and the quality of the thoughts that you want to have. And then your conditioning, do I like to be me? I want to create a world where it's positive to be me. It feels good to be me. And so doing everything, then cleaning everything else out that didn't support that and getting rid of it, just ignoring it, you know, not keeping those stories and thoughts and beliefs activated, but just letting them go and really anything new incoming, taking a stance of it's positive to be me. And this is how I'm going to interpret this and believe it so that it is positive to be me. Those are the your three strategies to create really powerful, life-changing self-love as a highly sensitive person. Yes. All right. So thank you for watching. If you are HSP who is ready for more one-on-one -on -one support this year, I have a three month flammable to fireproof program. Check that out on my website, emotionalfireacademy.com. And thanks for watching and like this video if you're still watching now, because it helps disseminate the information to other highly sensitive people who need it. So thank you. Bye.